Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to today's video. Quite a big update uh, today, so we're going to be uh, here for a little while uh, discussing today's update. We're going to look at El Nino and some of the headlines that we've been seeing uh, over the past couple of days, which means you've really latched onto this El Nino now. We've been talking about it uh, at Gaz Webbins for quite some time, but uh, now it's starting to get in towards uh, the media frame. So, uh, been a few headlines through the uh, last uh, few days talking about um, chance of a cold winter on the back of this El Nino, uh, and it seemed to be based on the fact that in 0910 we had an El Nino, and we had, uh, I'm sure you remember, a really cold winter. Um, it's not as simple as that, though, and I'll be showing you some charts in a moment to explain why. But before I get on with that, just to say about the ads, there's links to articles on all the pages at gazofficial.com. Have a browse through the widgets, any articles that you're interested in, please click through. You have to go off and read the articles, thanks so much for doing that. There's also video ads on most pages, they open out within the content, and then they uh, close back up again when you've watched them. So give them a watch, you'll be helping to pay for the website. Thanks very much uh, for doing that. Um, so really wet cold day down in the south today just start off with a radar picture from the weather outlook there's the rain across southern and southwestern parts of the country a horrible day down in the south not only rain it's also very cold as well certainly very cold for the time of year so this is from the website xc weather this shows you uh, the latest sort of uh, readings across the country Oh, we can see that in the south, um, many stations, uh, we'll say just recording 8, 9, 10 degrees, little rising turn uh, there across uh, the south Midlands, just at 8 Celsius, um, try some other places, middle wallop uh, recording 9 degrees, uh, and even on the south coast at Southampton, uh, we're just at 9 degrees as well, so pouring with rain and easterly wind and cold temperatures, it's a miserable old day. Um, this rain is going to carry on for the rest of this afternoon down in the south this is the uh, forecast chart from uh, website weather online this is from the high resolution nae model um we can see that uh, very wet uh at the moment across many southern southwestern parts of the country this is the forecast as it was at six o'clock in the morning for uh, uh, midday so going about bang on right i think for uh, where the rain is as we go through into six o'clock in the evening the rain is still there across many southern and southeastern parts of the country clearing up in the southwest but uh yeah it's a nasty day down in the south scotland stays out of trouble now, uh, as I said at the start of the video, we've uh, been seeing these headlines over the past couple of days about uh, the chance of a cold winter because we've got an El Nino uh, beginning to develop. So uh, this, for instance, saying El Nino is set to bring harsh winter to Britain. Um, and it's just indicative, really. Uh, it's from ITV weather, I think, that it's just indicative, really, of the headlines that we've been seeing in many of the papers and uh, on the telly over the past couple of days. We definitely do have an El Nino uh, beginning to take shape. I've spoken about this in the videos over the past uh, few weeks. This is the uh, latest sea surface temperature anomaly map from Monday. This will be updating later on uh, today. Um, and of course the El Nino, let's just uh, say what it is. It's the warm water that rises up across the equatorial Pacific from Peru to uh, Indonesia in that zone just there. So uh, when you get these red and orange colours appearing across the equator in the Pacific Ocean, that's telling you that uh, you're getting an El Nino uh, event developing. El Nino is mainly a Southern Hemisphere phenomenon in its uh, impacts. It impacts Australia, Indonesia, South America, um, and all of the islands in between. Uh, but it does affect the Northern, Northern Hemisphere as well, particularly America and Canada can get some quite big impacts uh, from these El Nino events. For us and Europe, the uh, impacts are always more controversial and they're not uniform. So that's the main thing to get across, really, uh, with this. Uh, despite the fact that the last uh, major El Nino that took place during uh, 2009 into 2010... Despite the fact that that El Nino did produce, uh, or did coincide, I should say, uh, with a cold winter in the United Kingdom and in America as well, it's not a uniform. Uh, it's uh, it's not a uniform uh, impact that will uh, be expected every time you get an El Nino. So this is the El Nino of uh, 2010. This is uh, the CISA temp 
sea surface temperature anomaly map from uh, the 4th of January 2010. And quite clearly, you can see that we do have El Nino conditions there uh, through the uh, equatorial Pacific. So it was an El Nino, definitely uh, about probably the strongest El Nino uh, up to that point since the 97-98 uh, uh, El Nino, but uh, nothing like as strong as a 97-98 uh, El Nino. So that is the chart for uh, 1997. This is actually the sea surface, sea surface temperature anomaly map for uh, the 6th of December 1997. And just look how much more intense the colours are uh, through the actual Pacific. Bright red colours. That was a, a super neon, a mega event that took place through 1997 and into 1998. So that's the first point to get across, is that the strength of these events does vary greatly. And uh, this one that coincided with a cold winter in uh, 2010, it was a moderate El Nino, almost borderline strong, but nowhere near as strong as the 97-98 event. Now, 97-98 actually coincides with a very mild winter, uh, despite the fact everything looks to be set up quite nicely, particularly in terms of the Atlantic sea surface temperatures and solar activities, not that strong. It did produce a very mild winter uh, for the United Kingdom. And, of course, it's a much stronger event. So maybe there is a tie-in there, but if you get a weaker El Nino, uh, your chance of a cold winter is perhaps uh, enhanced, whereas if you get a stronger El Nino, such as 97, 98, then you may be looking at uh, a milder winter, so it sort of forces the pattern and uh, brings up uh, mild air from the south. So this is how the two winters vary. This is the chart from the 13th of February, 1998. And uh, when it's a negative North Atlantic oscillation, we haven't got uh, sort of a westerly or a typical westerly setup with low pressure around eyes and high pressure through the Azores. But what we've got is this big ridge, and it was an omnipresent feature through winter, this big ridge here extending from North Africa and Mediterranean up into France and producing these exceptionally warm southerly winds. I'm sure you remember this day uh, very well, just before Valentine's Day 1998, where temperatures uh, were getting up to 17, 18, 19 degrees, quite widely summer light temperatures in the middle of February, whereas uh, this is the chart for the 5th of January 2010, and you see that it's a totally different pattern. All of this blocking up over Greenland and Iceland, bitterly cold winds extending down from the north. This was the coldest period of the winter of 2009-2010, sort of the first couple of weeks of January Bitter, bitter cold uh, couple of weeks with uh, temperatures generally staying below freezing through most of the period and lots and lots of heavy snow. So uh, I think I'll prove the point there between those two winters that just saying you've got an El Nino, so you'll get a cold winter because the last El Nino coincided with the cold winter. Unfortunately, and I wish it was the case, that it's as easy as this, but unfortunately it is not the case Uh and it makes life more difficult for us forecasters. So as I say, I wish it was the case. It was just as straightforward as saying, you've got an El Nino, so you're going to get this or that pattern. Uh, but it isn't, uh, I'm afraid. There's a couple of other uh, El Nino events between uh, 97 and 2010. Uh, this one is from 2002, uh, winter of 2002-2003. Had a fairly weak El Nino, almost borderline moderate. You can see the warmth there extending through the equatorial uh, Pacific. Uh, it was more of an eastern pace. El Nino. Uh, this one coincided with generally a mild winter for 2002-2003. And then we had another very weak El Nino. Didn't hardly make it to the threshold of an El Nino. Uh, actually, it's only just designated. But in 2006-2007, had a very weak El Nino. Again, pretty eastern-based uh, El Nino, which means the warmth is more off the coast of Peru as opposed to in the central part of the Pacific. Again, uh, this El Nino, 2006-2007, hardly, i say, makes it as an El Nino, but was designated just, uh, and this one coincides with a mild winter as well. Uh, and then we get the flip to La Nina through the spring of 2007, which coincides with that, uh, the summer of the floods of uh, 2007. So that is uh, something else that we have to look for when we come out of an El Nino, 
going to a landing, yeah, uh, which is the cold water coming up through the actual Pacific, that tends to uh, coincide with very bad winters. So uh, if we go to the landing in next year, uh, watch out for the summer of 2016. It could be uh, a pretty grim one. But as I say, the, uh, the idea about El Nino and a cold winter necessarily uh, go, coincide with one another is not particularly the case. Um, it does depend greatly on where the uh, warmest of the water is. That's another point, as well as the strength of the El Nino uh, varying from event to event. Where you get the uh, water is up, the warm water is also important. If you get it warmer through the central part of the actual Pacific, a Madoki or a Madiki, uh, central based El Nino, so if you get it somewhere there um, and have it cooler just here, uh, off the coast of Peru, then that often coincides with a greater risk, doesn't guarantee anything, but it coincides with a greater risk of a colder winter, whereas if the warmer water is uh, more in this zone just here off the coast of Peru, um, and then the central part is uh, a bit cooler, uh, then an eastern-based El Nino, as that is, uh, tends to coincide uh, with a risk of a milder winter. So we've got to wait and see Two crucial factors on this, how strong the El Nino gets and where the warmest of the water is. If it's central base, then that will enhance, won't guarantee anything, but it will perhaps enhance our risk of getting a cold winter to coincide with this El Nino. But lots of ifs and buts there, and it just isn't as straightforward, unfortunately, as uh, the headlines have been suggesting. SOI is continuing to crash uh, some of the oscillation index. This is an index that reflects the state of the atmosphere between Tahiti and Darwin in the north of Australia. When it goes very negative with the uh, southern oscillation index, that tells you that the atmosphere and the oceans are uh, coupling up to produce uh, an El Nino effect. So that's why the media is latching on to this, why the warming is uh, intensifying through the equatorial Pacific, because the atmosphere and the oceans are coupling up. As I explained in the video earlier in the week, we had some very negative numbers. 9th of uh, May coming out at minus 46. 10th of May coming out at minus 44. Exceptionally negative with the SOI. And these ex uh, exceptionally negative numbers have carried on, not to the same extent, but for instance, the 12th comes out at minus 35. Uh, the 13th, minus 31. And today, uh, is coming out at minus 27.7. Of course, Australia is in front of us, and this is from the Bureau of Meteorology in Australia, uh, this uh, this index. So uh, today, uh, as it was in Australia a few hours ago, comes out at minus 27.70. Still very negative with the SOI. So the warmth, uh, warm water will continue to upwell through the equatorial Pacific um, whilst we're getting these very negative numbers. For sure, we are going into an El Nino but to work out the impacts for us, it's going to be a case of how strong the El Nino gets. If it gets as strong as 97, 98, it's going to be very difficult. Uh, whatever else is going on, it'll be very difficult, I think, to get a cold winter. If it is uh, uh, not as intense as 97, 98, and uh, then we've got to start looking at exactly where the warm water is and everything else that's going on. Uh, but I'm sure you know about it if you watch my winter updates. We have to look at solar activity, have to look at what's happening in the Atlantic in terms of the Atlantic sea surface temperature anomalies, have to see how quickly through the autumn snow cover advances over Russia. So there's loads of other things uh, to look at. The El Nino on its own is not the uh, only factor by any means. So uh, just going back to uh, the next week or so, uh, finally, the temperature anomaly is uh, going to be very uh, cool over the coming week. This is the anomaly for the 14th to the 22nd of May. You see these blue colours here, not just over the UK, but virtually across the whole of uh, northern Europe. It's only down in the Mediterranean where the temperature anomalies are coming out warmer than ours. So a very cool week uh, coming up. When you think how long these charts were showing red colours above average temperatures through most of the winter and on into the early part of the uh, spring, but May is or has produced a complete flip around, and we've got a pretty cool week of it uh, coming up. The precipitation anomaly is coming out uh, above average a little bit as well across many parts, so it could be cool 
and unsettled. Not a very inspiring week uh, coming up. Here's the uh, GFS chart for Monday. Low pressure is going to be in control of that. we wet and uh, quite windy weather across the country. As we move through next week, that low pressure will sink down across the country and uh, open the door to northerly winds. So that's going to start to pull the air in from the North Pole, unfortunately, through the course of next week. We can expect depressed daytime temperatures, quite a bit of precipitation, uh, so a fair amount of rain. And by night, I think we still, even though we're getting towards the last stage of May, we will still have an ongoing risk next week of nighttime frost. So uh, gardeners beware. Very late in the year now. Uh, but uh, gardeners do beware if you've got any tender plants, cover them up next week because uh, I think you're going to have some very uh, very inclement weather uh, for the delicates. Go through to the end of next week and still in that broad pattern with the high pressure reaching through the Atlantic, low pressure to the north and the northeast are bringing down these cool northerly winds. And that goes on then into bank holiday weekend. This is day 10, Sunday 24th of May. And there's no great deviation from the pattern. We've still got the high pressure out to west. We've still got the low pressure to the east. We're still bringing down these northerly winds. That's the GFS. East of the Earth is very similar with all of this. Cloud and rain spreads across the country early next week. Low pressure is in over the country through to the middle of next week, bringing down very cool air. The black line here is the jet stream. You see that is going to the south of the country. So on the cool side of the jet, under an area of low pressure, it won't be great. Uh, we go through to the end of next week and into the bank holiday weekend. And no real change in the pattern. Low pressure remains in control. Lots of blocking in the Atlantic and going up to the north uh, of the country as well. This is the chart for day 10. Um, Sunday 24th of May. By the way, I'll be having a look uh, in depth at the uh, Bank Holiday Weekend again on the events page uh, this evening around 7 o'clock. So if you want to know what could be happening in terms of the detail anyway for the Bank Holiday Weekend, come back to the events page uh, this evening. Just leave you though with the very end of the GFS uh, to today, this morning, the midnight run, which did show quite a dramatic shift right at the very end of the month. There we go. We go through to Saturday the 30th of May, and look at that, a total change of a pattern. Again, high pressure is in over Scandinavia by that time. Low pressure is out to west, and that's bringing up much, much warmer. In fact, quite hot air uh, coming up from the south. So in the space of just a few days, it's totally flipped again, and very warm temperatures pushing up from the Mediterranean. Just to show you how quickly things can change. Now that's right at the very end of the GFS, so of course it's not to be relied upon, it's 384 hours away, but it just shows you that, despite the fact that you appear to be locked in to quite a cool and unsettled pattern, it doesn't take many days uh, for things to shift, and uh, of course we're not even into the summer yet, so if you're wondering when uh, the summer like temperatures are going to arrive um, if you're wanting some summer warmth, don't despair, we're not even into the summer yet, and things can change very very quickly but uh, just coming back to sum it all up well it looks like we're going to be in for an unsettled uh, week and pretty cool as well uh, and that takes us up to Bank Holiday weekend we'll have a look in depth at the Bank Holiday tonight on the events page but bigger picture it's still the El Nino what's going on with that it is developing but uh, does it mean we're going to have a cold winter uh, I don't think so not on its own that's it for now thanks for watching